In 2008, on a trip to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, I was to meet and film a group of guys that know a bit about estimating fear. When you first arrive in a place like this, with its bustling tourist areas and beautiful people and scenery everywhere, you would have to think that the biggest challenges faced would be running out of sunscreen, stubbing a toe on the beach, or water in your snorkel. With the world's busiest cruise ship port, where people by the thousands come to soak up the sun on its unparalleled beaches, to dive into the crystal blue Caribbean Sea with its amount of marine life so vast, one could spend years swimming and diving here and never completely witness all that it has to offer. Or venture into pristine jungle to experience a once in a lifetime opportunity to spend time with a multitude of wildlife unique only to this area. Not to mention the ongoing mystery of the Mayan civilization that at one time numbered over 10 million people and whose remnants still remain strong and intact reluctantly giving up their long-held secrets little by little to the modern-day explorer. So what does estimating fear have to do with any of this? The answer to that question is that wherever you are standing in the Yucatan Peninsula, chances are it is directly below your feet. You are in the heart of underwater cave diving in Mexico. This is Steve Bogarts. Steve is an underwater cave explorer with over 6,000 dives into what is considered by many to be the most challenging and dangerous environment found anywhere in the world. Steve will spend months, even years, hacking his way through virgin jungle, looking for cracks and holes just like this one, checking for possible entries into the underwater world. What is it that drives him? What compels him to keep pushing further? In 1924, when asked the question, why do you want to climb Mount Everest? George Mallory responded with his now famous answer, because it is there. Interestingly enough, and with all due respect to Mr. Mallory, to the general public that quote is more famous than the man himself, and was certainly the short answer to a very complicated question. One that if you have to ask, you probably wouldn't understand the answer to. Thus, we have George Mallory's famous quote, most great explorers are driven, solitary people, difficult to comprehend, but usually with a great story. Here is a story of a cave diver. Originally I'm from London, England. I actually learned to dive in the Maldives while on holiday. And then all the rest of my diving after that, and my diving education, uh, took place in the UK. And it was mostly wreck diving in fairly challenging conditions, cold water, dark, uh, lots of current. So it was a good preparation for you know, all the diving that I would do in other parts of the world later on. I always had an interest in cave diving, even before I became a diver actually. So the idea of cave diving always fascinated me. So it was something that I always knew that I wanted to do. And I actually started cave diving in the UK, but just a very small amount of cave diving that I did there. And that's very different to the type of cave diving we have here. It's usually very shallow, very short sumps in freezing cold water and zero visibility. And you usually have to do a bit of dry caving to get anywhere near the water anyway. 
So quite different to sort of driving up to a cenote in your car, putting your gear on and just jumping into this crystal clear water that's 26 degrees centigrade. I first came to Mexico about 10 years ago to get further cave training and fell in love with the caves here. And it was a life changing experience. Cave diving is very dangerous, it's very addictive. Once you've actually dove in the caves here, then the chances are that it's going to change your life forever. And it certainly changed mine because I knew at that point that I was going to have to come back here full time and spend some time here exploring. And when I originally moved back here, which was about eight, nine years ago now, I really only tended to be here for a year or so and do more diving in the caves and maybe even possibly do a little bit of exploration. Well, here I am eight years later, still diving in the caves, still exploring, still enjoying it, still finding new challenges, um, still really totally fascinated in what I'm finding and what I'm discovering and still with lots of new challenges ahead of me and way more cave to explore than I have the time or money to uh, pursue, unfortunately. After agreeing to let me follow him around with a camera for the next week, I meet up with Steve at the fill station to pick up tanks. He has some exciting new leads to follow on some virgin cenotes deeper in the jungle. But for today, he needs to finish resurveying some older existing exploration lines. Steve will pick up full tanks of air here, first checking the gas mixture of each to make sure that they're correct for the day's particular dive plan. There are many different gas mixtures and he knows that the wrong mix could at the very least cause serious problems and possibly be fatal. He will double check and we will be on our way. As Steve begins repacking his gear for the drive, he finds a bit of a surprise in his wetsuit. See the babies on the back? Okay. Time for you to go back to the jungle. It's a whole nest of baby scorpions all living in my suit. That would have been fun, taking those for a long dive. After clearing out the last of the scorpions from his gear, we are now on our way to the day's dive site. This is the pit. It was originally discovered in 1996 by Dan Linz and Kay Walton when they were exploring a remote tunnel off the Dos Ojos system. It is 400 feet to the bottom with numerous cave passages. It has been extensively explored by cave diving legends such as Paul Heinerth and Bill Phillips. It is from here that Steve has done some of his most challenging exploration, laying line back thousands of feet at depths approaching 400 feet, with dives up to 11 hours long in areas previously thought to be all but impassable. I was diving solo with a double redundant closed circuit rebreather system, um, which gave me like 24 hours of life support. We're expecting the dive to be around about 10 to 12 hours long. It was actually 10 and a half hours surface to surface time, which included the descent, the bottom time, the ascent and the decompression that I was doing during the dive. I had a whole support team out here with me and the dive wouldn't have been possible without those people assisting me to, to do what I did, you know, to put someone on the end of a line like that. There's a whole team that come behind them and, and put them there. And I was able to actually uh, explore and survey almost a thousand feet of new cave at an average depth of about 330 feet, uh, maximum depth 360 feet. After lowering his tanks and scooter down into the water, the diver will be on to carefully assembling and checking his gear. Then we will make our way to the water's edge for the 25 foot plunge to the cenote below. As I look down, white fluffy clouds with an almost heavenly appearance float in the water column well over 100 feet below. There it is, toxic, corrosive, and beautiful, the hydrogen sulfide layer. So what you're seeing now is me diving through a hydrogen sulfide layer in the cave. Hydrogen sulfide is an extremely toxic gas, and if you were to breathe it for any extended period on the surface in a high enough concentration, it would kill you pretty quickly. 
Sometimes on the end of the dives I'll sort of scooter in and out of it or swim in and out of it and I almost feel like I'm flying through the clouds. The light beams coming down and hitting it and it's almost got this fluorescent blue glow. It just looks incredible, particularly at a place like the pit. Rising above the hydrogen sulfide layer after finishing checking the lines at the bottom of the cenote, he then grabs his scooter and heads toward the opening in the side of this immense cavern. The importance of the guideline in a cave cannot in any way be overstated. In most cases, it is the diver's only reference to the surface. It is also the basis for all of the maps and charts that are cataloged for future exploration. While moving quickly into the cave on his scooter, he will keep a constant visual reference with the guideline. Using scooters, the diver's moving as much as four times faster than swimming, and at this speed, it is very easy to lose contact with the line. These divers encounter many amazing things while exploring these systems. This is a fantastic example of some long-lost camel bones. These camels, or camelops as they are called, were much larger than the camels we are familiar with today, and at one time thrived from Alaska to Central America, but along with many other species of animals, went extinct at the end of the last ice age, approximately 10,000 years ago. This one either wandered in here and was lost, or fell into the water and drowned, his body deposited here on display on this ledge for all eternity. Then we use scooters, right, underwater torpedoes, and stage bottles to get us to the ends of the existing lines so we have more time, once we're at the end of those lines, to actually explore effectively. So we'll scooter in, breathing from one or more stages, and we'll drop those stages as we're going into the caves as we hit thirds on each stage bottle, leaving two thirds of our gas to be able to make an exit with, should our exit be delayed. Uh, and then eventually we'll get to the point where we've dropped our last stage bottle and we'll drop our scooter as well. Steve will install a line arrow on the guideline, always pointing in the direction of the exit. These arrows are marked with his name and or a keyword for his own safety, as well as for survey information. Carefully tying his reel into the existing guideline, he will make a jump from this line to the line he's resurveying today, always maintaining a continuous line to the surface. So as you're going, you're laying the guideline, making tie-offs as you're swimming, trying to get an overall picture of the cave as you're going, trying to build up a mental picture so that you can have natural navigation as well as the guideline to lead you back to your exit point. Swimming along, the diver comes to a restriction. With side mount tanks as opposed to tanks on his back, he can easily make it into many areas that a diver with back mount tanks could never possibly get through. Unfortunately, this passage is a dead end, and by the looks of all the percolation falling from the ceiling, one that has not been entered into before and possibly a bit unstable. Every year, untrained divers enter into underwater caves and are lost. With one kick of the fin or exhaust of bubbles, visibility can easily turn to zero, making it all but impossible for the ill-equipped diver with no cave training to make their way back to the entrance. For the properly prepared and experienced cave diver, this is just another day of exploration. Undeterred, he presses on. He locates his line and very meticulously begins his resurvey. So as you're swimming along the guideline, every tie-off becomes a survey station. And you're going to collect at least three pieces of information at each survey station. You're going to collect a depth, you're going to collect a compass azimuth to the next survey station, and you're going to get the distance between those stations. And it's very important that the guideline is laid well so that it's safe, so we can follow it back. It's our primary reference back to the surface, but also so that we can gather all our survey data accurately uh, and efficiently as well. Finishing his survey, the diver picks up his stage tank and scooter and works his way back to the entrance. Exiting the cave into the cavern zone of the pit is an image that is near impossible to fully capture on film, and one that is as unforgettable as any I have ever seen. I didn't get the chance to talk to Dan Linz or Kay Walton while filming this project, but I can only speculate as to what they may have felt when seeing it for the first time. For me, it has all the magic of a sunrise over the Caribbean Sea. This is clearly a great part of why these guys do what they do. 
The days ahead will bring many great challenges, such as hair-raising wildlife encounters, a cave collapse, as well as a looming threat of devastation to the cave system and the Yucatan freshwater supply. But for now, Steve will pack up and head into his office to input today's valuable survey data. The day begins with another aforementioned beautiful Caribbean sunrise. After my morning coffee, I am off to meet Steve and Robbie Schmidner at Shibalba. Robbie is Steve's longtime exploration partner. Shibalba is a local dive shop belonging to Robbie and Annika Schmidner. The Mayan word Shibalba roughly translates into place of fear or phantoms, a wonderful place dedicated to sickness, starvation, fear, destitution, pain, and ultimately death. What a cute little name for a dive shop that specializes in one of the world's most dangerous activities. When you meet Robbie, it all sort of makes sense. He has a great sense of humor and a carefree and likable way about him. It's easy to see why Steve thinks so highly of him. This cave here, mm -hmm. that is what we've been into to a special, mm -hmm. right behind the, the... The mosquito, aptly the, named. Yeah, mm. behind the fireman station. Um, this is Eradura we're going to go today, where we we get help in getting in. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, the original data of it was just that part from here to there. And in four dives there, I made this the cave like triple the size what it was. Mm -hmm. Robbie's been living out here in Mexico now for the last 10 years. Uh, he has a family here, he has three children. Um, he's originally from Germany. Uh, from southern Germany. He learned to dive in southern Germany. He came to Mexico uh, because of the diving and did his first sort of cenote and cavern and cave dives here and pretty much fell in love with the area and it became an addiction for him just like it is for me and he realized that he was going to have to move back here full time which is what he did and he started working at a dive shop in Tulum and in his free time he would go out and go exploring and over the years, uh, as he got more experience, um, he became a cave instructor and eventually opened his own dive shop, which is now very successful, uh, and is continuing to explore in the cave systems down here, which is his passion, just as it is for me. Uh, Robbie and I have been exploring together now for about the last six years, um, and we work really well together as a team. Um, it's really fun working with Robbie. We both have uh, strengths that complement the other person's abilities and strengths. Um, one of the misconceptions that a lot of people have is that Robbie and I dive together all the time, although that's actually not really the case and we very rarely, if ever, dive together, although we are exploring together. So Robbie will be exploring a cave system from one direction towards me and I'll be exploring another cave system from another direction towards him, trying to make a connection, for example. You know, we discuss exactly what we're doing and how we're going to do it. We help each other um, with cutting trails and getting equipment to the water and getting each other in and out of the water. But most of the dives we do are actually solo dives. Um, so we're not actually in the water together at the same time in the same place. So what's your plan for today? Well, you carry all my gear to that entrance right here. Sure. Do that, <laughs> do that for me. <laughs> I get dressed and then I dive down here. You can get dressed by way. yourself, you don't want me to help you do that. Well, <laughs> a helping hand is never bad, is it? <laughs> you get more than the hand boy. We're going to go down here, actually upstream. Steve will spend this morning helping Robbie carry gear out to an important site that Robbie is exploring. He will not be diving himself, but instead it is his turn to be the pack mule for Robbie. It is hot and incredibly hard work but the two happily take it all in stride as they fight to make their way through the heavy jungle and hungry mosquitoes to the cenote. I think grateful for each other's company. Here we are, Herradura. I don't think this place is going to turn into a snorkel club. Well, they just put two big excavators on it, and we're right there. You're right. So, here's the guideline, tied off on the surface. So we can uh, GPS this point, so we can begin our survey data from. So that it geo references all the various different cave systems we're exploring. And then the guideline, obviously, is continuous throughout the cave. 
we're just going to hopefully lay some more guideline today and then he's going to survey that guideline back and then later on when we're back at the shop you're going to see us like putting the survey data into the computer um, so that we can actually see where he went today and where we need to keep pushing to connect to the other cave systems nearby uh, and for the continuing exploration we're doing. As much time as these guys spend in the jungle, you would have to wonder if they encounter any interesting wildlife. It so happens they do. Robbie shares a great story about one such encounter. Um, well, the Czechia story. Where to start? So, I go there exploring and I find a cenote by going through the cave. I see daylight. I go up there. I surface and there's a nice open cenote right there. A nice stone roof on top of my head. And I was fixing my guideline, which I obvious, obviously brought with me, to a stalactite. It took me two, three minutes to get that fixed. And then I take my light and look around along the edges of that ceiling above me. And as I go over to that corner, my light gets reflected by two big eyes, like boom, like, whoa! <laughs> right at that moment, I uh, kind of got shocked and froze. So I couldn't move a lot anymore. But as I'm there looking at that animal, stands up, walks over to me and was just like in television. Head down and he saw the shoulder blades going up and down of the animal it was amazing, amazing. Um, it came over and stand right five meters in front of me, big head like that looking at me and probably didn't know neither was in the water there. I didn't smell like a human, I just came out of the water and it was just like like up to here out of the water and looked at me I looked at him and my idea was to blend him you know? so he started walking up and down the water line looking at me what is that weird thing there in the water and as I'm there sweating like a pig basically um, my my mask starts to fuck and I couldn't see him anymore and the whole situation got more and more stressing so I tried to get that mask off my head and then the jaguar just stands right again right in front of me looking at me and suddenly goes down like that and I was scared he would jump now I go backwards and notice that I till he is stuck in mud so I couldn't get away but by trying to get backwards I put the light down and the jaguar stand up again what the hell is that I put my light up again and it went down again so what he tried to do was to Look what is behind that light. After time passed by, um, I switched off the light. I couldn't do anything, but the Jaguar walked up and down the waterline into the daylight and he saw the fur really nicely, brilliant, shiny, beautiful animal. And then after a while, he turned around, went behind a big boulder. And one more look, oh, that weird creature is still there and disappeared in the jungle. Checked my computer and it was 10 minutes surface time. That was amazing, amazing scene. As Robbie finishes gearing up for his exploration, Steve is already busy making some exploration plans of his own. All right, you might come back for me in three hours, something three hours? like that. Fine, man. Cool. Okay. Have a good dive. Good luck. Thanks. Usually the guys will take the opportunity to hack around in the jungle exploring while waiting for each other to emerge. But today, Steve has other plans. Since we are only 30 minutes away from a small airstrip near Playa, he will take an hour or so to fly over an area of interest. He has gotten a tip on a cenote that is out a bit off the main road, but with a location that holds promise for a connection that they have been working on for quite some time. It is interesting to note that in this area the ground is like Swiss cheese. Virtually all of the water used for everything from drinking to watering plants comes from this underground cave system, and they are all connected. Some of the connections are big enough to drive a jumbo jet through, and some are as small as a pin. If you soil one piece, you soil it all. And it is quickly becoming soil. The rapid expansion here, like in other parts of the Caribbean, is happening at an incredible rate. Divers used to use horses and Sherpas and hike hours to dive cenotes that are now being swallowed up by development. 
It is not uncommon to be driving along and see divers crossing busy highways in full gear to dive cenotes that are literally just feet from the passing traffic. The nearness of fast development on such a large scale in extreme close proximity to the cenotes and the sea are now causing problems of a very disturbing nature. Recently, a piece of film has surfaced that was shot in a cave very close to where Robbie is diving today. Here it shows definitive proof of the pollution that is enveloping these once pristine caves. This bacteria is feeding on human waste and is spreading from underneath coastal boomtowns at an alarming rate. This sequence shows a relative comparison with a healthy cave. You can see the percolation falling directly to the floor, not hanging in the water column. This clip shot at the same spot a minute later shows more of the same, but also shows a blind cave fish in the foreground, a really nice indicator of a healthy area of cave. This film has received national media coverage and has been a great tool in educating builders on the delicate balance between growth and conservation in this area. The goal of these divers is not to stop growth, but to help educate developers to grow responsibly by raising their awareness about the fragile ecosystem that without life could not exist in this or any part of the world. Of course, you know, whatever you see from the air, um, just because you've seen it from the air doesn't necessarily mean that it's very easily accessible. So the other thing we'd be looking for are any kinds of trails or mansuras or roads that are close to these target sites that we've identified to make getting there as logistically easy as possible. Sometimes that's not the case and you may have to hack your way through the jungle for several kilometers to be able to get to these places. And then to be honest, you know, when you see it from the air, you don't really know what its potential is until you actually go there and, and dive in. It looks as though he has found the cenote he is looking for. We will pass over a couple of times to be sure. The spot will be carefully marked with a GPS so it will be identifiable from the ground on tomorrow's exploration. Steve will go back, pick up Robbie, and take him to the dive shop, where they will enter Robbie's survey information into the database and see what his cave looks like. 16, 24, Nice long shots, big cave. Mm -hmm. 17. What we got back from his dive, we just finished inputting all the survey data that Robbie collected while he was diving. Um, so now we need to see how the, the map looks with this new survey data added onto the map. So let's actually process and view the cave. Okay, so this is all the caves in the region, but the one we're interested in is one Robbie was in today, which is Era Dura down here. Okay, and I think this is the line you laid today, right, Robbie? Yeah. Yeah. Of this two lines. So the cave has grown, just not in the direction that we'd like it to grow. Steve is up and running very early this morning. His girlfriend Anna, a local dive instructor originally from Germany, will join him to meet Don Pablo. Don Pablo comes from a very old and important family in Tulum and is the owner of the cenote in which Steve is interested in exploring. After securing permission to explore and dive on Don Pablo's property, Steve wastes no time in making tracks out into the jungle. This is where the real exploration takes place. Steve wastes no time in getting into his hiking gear and getting the machete sharpened. He will mark where he has left the truck on the GPS and check the direction of travel one last time before getting on his way. After hiking in a few miles, we come across a solution chimney or hole in the ground. Steve starts explaining to me about how it was formed, but I only hear up until the part about wild animals, among other things, using them for dens, at which time I realize he's actually going to climb in and have a look. He later explains, this area receives about a meter and a half of rain annually, which absorbs atmospheric carbon dioxide, creating an acidic solution of carbonic acid which dissolves the limestone it comes in contact with. What this means is that the cave environment can be a bit unstable at times, and collapses, although rare, are not unheard of. Well, I can't get through in back mount. I'm going to have to no mount this one. 
Later, I ask Steve if he has had any experience with underwater collapse, and he shares a very interesting story with me. And there was one particular instance where I was exploring, and I was exploring through an area of breakdown that was unstable. I knew it was unstable, but I felt like I was really close to getting through this area and possibly connecting to another cave system. So I continued to push, even though the inner voice was telling me it's far enough and you should turn around. And sure enough, the cave actually collapsed behind me, blocking my exit. Um, and at that point, I had no other way back out of the cave system. I was in zero visibility with most of my equipment off. I got partially buried in part of the collapse and had to dig my way out of it. Uh, I decided to carry on a little bit further into the cave just to collect my thoughts and sort of take stock of the situation. So I carried on a little way, I got into some slightly clearer water uh, and at that point started noticing some organic debris on the floor and decided, you know what, I think that probably there's an opening up ahead. I didn't know that for sure. So I decided that I would go back quickly and have a look at the area of collapse and see how bad it was. Uh, and if there was no way back through it, then I'd continue exploring further into the cave system and hope to find an alternative exit. I had lots of gas left. So I had lots of time to do this, which is a, a nice thing, but obviously that gas supply is finite, so I only had a certain amount of time to find an exit or find a way back. So I turned around, swam back along my line to the area of collapse, obviously doing this by touch alone since I was in zero visibility. And I got to the area of collapse and the line was completely buried. The passage I'd come through had disappeared entirely. Uh, I decided I would sort of see how much of a collapse there was so I started moving some rocks to see if I could sort of dig through the collapse and that just caused a further collapse and I almost got partially buried again and at that point I decided enough's enough I'm going to back away and I'm going to continue further into the cave and hope I can find uh, another exit and I did about another 500 feet further into the cave I actually found another cenote I was very happy to see that cenote and I ran the line up to that snote and that was my uh, my way out of the cave system. Crawling his way down the corridor of the solution chimney to the back of the chamber, Steve makes a bit of a disappointing observation. Okay, that's the end of the cave and no water. So, one more cave, no water, nowhere to go. Oh well. Another day, another hole, another try. As I said, Cave exploration wasn't glamorous. It seems this hole in the ground was a dead end, but did nothing to deter this explorer's spirit of adventure. He is at home here and seems most alive when stuck in some hole, or covered with muck, or picking off ticks, which he will spend a good part of this evening doing. The next half hour finds Steve in the cool waters of what should be the cenote he has been searching for. He will get in and free dive at first with no gear to see if there's available cave passage to explore but there is no way to know without actually diving in to take a look. Okay, so now we find out whether all that effort was worth it. Let's see if there's any cave here. As Steve sinks below the surface, I am aware of one simple certainty. In the jungle, something is always watching. From the incredibly loud howler monkey to wild boar, to wild cats, and to, of course, crocodiles. This jungle is every bit as dangerous as it is beautiful, and so Steve is a welcome sight as he returns from the murky depths. Woo. Cool. Definitely worth coming back here. Plenty of cave. Before moving forward any further, I think it is imperative we move back a few years to the UK and the genesis of cave diving. The world's first cave dives were done in 1935 at a place called Swildon's Hole, located on the southern edge of the Mendip Hills near Wells in Somerset, England. The first dive was made by Jack Shepard using a homemade dry suit surface-fed from a modified bicycle pump. 
Subsequent dives were made by Graham Balcom and Jack Shepard, with penetrations in Swildon's Hole reaching 170 feet into the system and were the first successfully documented cave dives in history. Other notable cave diving accomplishments that can be attributed to the British are the first use of fins in cave diving in 1948, as opposed to the previous practice of bottom walking that would actually continue to be the preferred method until well into the 50s. Mike Boone in 1962 was the first to use a single hose regulator, the first to use side mount tanks, and also popularized the use of pressurized air and open circuit diving, as opposed to oxygen rebreathers that limited divers to shallower depths in the caves. Mike Wooding, a pioneer in the use of back mount cylinders in the caves, is credited with being the first diver to reach the 1,000 foot penetration mark. The 70s saw the likes of divers such as Martin Farr, John Parker, Oliver Stratham and Jeff Yeadon pushing each other further to new limits, with Stratham and Yeadon in 1979 reaching a penetration of 6,000 feet on a single dive, and Farr reaching a depth of 150 feet, both records at the time. So here we are again at the end of the road. A bit of checking last night, and thankfully Steve has found a way in that has brought us much closer to the cenote that he will explore. Well, I am thankful. But Steve seems a bit disappointed that the newer road is here at all, as with roads come people, and with people come development. His world is shrinking, and I sense his sadness. But for today, there is exploring and diving to do, and in that, I sense his excitement. So with that thought in mind, we head out. Within about 15 minutes, we come to a large hill that I suddenly realize is no hill at all, but a pyramid, a real unexcavated mine pyramid. It is hard to imagine we are hiking over what once was a city of possibly thousands of people. I am ready to hang out here a while and explore. Steve, however, having hiked over a few ruins in his years spent exploring, is not as easily distracted. A good section of this new way to the cenote leads directly on top of a nice, clean, and well-used game trail. The trail leads us through a spectacular dry cave. Walking through the cave and out the back brings a wonderful surprise, a beautiful and undiscovered cenote. What a great place to stop for a quick rest as we still have a ways to go and we have a good two or three trips back to the truck for the rest of the gear. It is a beautiful spot and Steve will make a note of it for further exploration. For now, a quick rinse and a few minutes to sit and enjoy the peace and think of what lies ahead. With the heat of the day at its peak, the well-rested explorer will make the long, hard push to our final destination to drop his 120-pound load of tanks before returning twice more to the truck for the rest of his dive and overnight gear. We have arrived, and it is just as serene and peaceful as we left it the day before. Everything seems perfect except for the fact that a rather large crocodile along with a snapping turtle have taken up residence in the cenote. Steve is completely unfazed and is ready for a quick break before heading back to the truck for the next loads. Welcome to my world. Uh, this is my office. This is where I spend most of my working days and this is also actually where I spend most of my time off as well. We're at a cenote, beautiful cenote, here in the middle of the jungle. Uh, and these are very, very special places, very natural places, pristine, untouched by man pretty much at this point in time and that's why I love them so much and that's why I love to spend time here because they give me so much positive energy uh, and make me feel so good. It gets me away from all the things that stress me out about the modern world. There's no people, there's no cars, there's no cell phones, there's no computers. Um, so it's just a complete break from all of those things that are part of our modern life. And we come here and I'm just surrounded by the plants and the animals and all the natural things that we're divorced from to a certain extent in the lives that we lead these days. So I feel very lucky and very privileged to be able to spend most of my time in really unique and beautiful places like this. And the only real danger is that I end up spending all my time out here and I, I become a hermit and I never leave the caves. After his break and a few more loads of gear, Steve gets his camp set up. Before turning in for the night, he will relax and not his guideline for tomorrow's dive. The line is knotted every 10 feet, 
and is not only the only continuing reference to the surface, but it is also used as a ruler to measure distance for the surveys in the cave. So having knotted all this line, now we need to put it on a reel. My favourite exploration reel. This one was a present from Robbie, actually, after we made the connection between Nehoshnachich and Sakak Tun. And it's a very cool reel. The exploration dive we made, uh, we actually both dive at the same time. Robbie from uh, the Sakak Tun side and me from the Nehoshnachich side. And we timed our dive so that we'd arrive at the connection point at more or less the, the same time. And we could do a handshake connection, we'd actually meet underwater. I mean, we've been working on this project together for so long that we actually wanted to do the final dive, the final connection together. And it worked out perfectly. We timed our dives, we arrived at the connection point at exactly the same time. Um, we planted a bottle of champagne, we did the final tie off of the lines between the two cave systems on the neck of the bottle of the champagne, we did a handshake, we took some photographs, we turned around and we headed back out the way we'd come in. And that was just an incredible experience, I mean we were just so stoked and so happy, we were walking on air, you know, for weeks afterwards. Uh, and actually Robbie's daughter was born three days after the connection, which just like made it all the sweeter as well, so a really incredible experience. Um, but just one step in the journey and we're continuing that journey, we're continuing the exploration, we're continuing to, to learn more and find out more about these unique incredible cave systems and now we're sort of like searching for another holy grail of cave diving which is the connection between the Nahotch section of Sakak Toon and Sistema Dos Ojos uh, to once again make Sakak Toon the world's longest underwater cave system. Another beautiful jungle morning. Steve is eager to get into the water and find out if all of his hard work has paid off. As luck would have it, another visitor has moved into his wetsuit. This is so common, Steve hardly acknowledges it, except to make sure that it isn't hurt when he returns it gently back to the jungle. The diver will take his time assembling his gear, carefully taking stock of each piece of equipment. He does not want to get back into the cave and discover an important part of his life support has been forgotten or neglected. Steve glides into the cenote. The crocodile that has been standing guard all night nearby suddenly opens his mouth in a seemingly aggressive manner. The diver moves in, unimpressed by the large croc's behavior. He has seen it many times before and is comfortable with the knowledge that what seems like an aggressive gesture on the part of the crocodile is actually his way of reducing his body temperature. As he sits quietly with his mouth open, his body heat is lost through the soft, moist skin of his mouth and tongue. Steve ties off his guideline installs his line arrow, and sinks into the cavern. There are simply no words to describe the majesty of free-falling in a space like this. Looking out from the cave into the beautiful cavern zone, it is hard to imagine the danger and risk that lay just a few feet behind me, and the incredible strength, determination, and tenacity it takes to explore it. Swimming along, the diver suddenly stops. He has seen something of interest. On closer inspection, he finds himself staring at what looks quite possibly to be human bones. After a moment, he realizes that is exactly what they are. Finds such as these are becoming more and more common in this area with more divers venturing into these caves. A recent team of scientists and archaeologists have just uncovered four skeletal remains that radiocarbon dating showed to be between 11,000 and 14,000 years old not far from here, making them the oldest ever found in the Americas. During the last ice age, sea level was as much as 200 feet lower than it is today. These remains are roughly 2,500 feet back in the cave and in approximately 60 feet of water. It is possible that this poor soul walked into this cave looking for shelter or hiding from an enemy, only to be lost. These types of finds are not to be handled in any way, but are to be reported to the Mexican Instituto Nacional de Antropología, or INA, for further research and cataloging. As I film Steve laying line, I am taken back to all of the fascinating things I have seen in these caves. There are places that are so incredibly beautiful, there is no way to show them as they actually are in film, and no words that can accurately describe them. There is the hydrogen sulfide layer that I can only describe as Beauty and the Beast, unbelievable to look at, but has a foul odor and can burn like acid. There is the halocline where the fresh water sits on top of the saltwater lens, 
and when disturbed mixes like oil and water, and when left undisturbed, gives the appearance of swimming through a sheet of glass. And if there was ever any question about the water in these caves flowing like an underground river, you only need witness the flow of the halocline on the ceiling of this cave. There are the ancient mind pots that seem to talk to you from the past, reminding you that there were people here thousands of years ago that worked and lived much as we do today. There are the bones of the owners of those pots that felt and learned and loved that I somehow get the feeling would rather not be a mystery or a piece to anyone's puzzle, but would just rather be left alone. And there is the strength and determination of the cave diver who pushes himself and that of his environment to see and discover more, to know more, not just for themselves, but for all of us. Steve will finish his exploration of this cave today. He may or may not get what he came for, but one thing is certain, he will continue to explore these underground treasures, hoping in the near future to make the Holy Grail connection between Sakaktun and Dos Ojos. And that connection will be a great thing when it is finally made, but this is just a small part of the big puzzle of why these explorers put their lives in the line. As of today, December 30th, 2008, 30% of the world's population does not have a sufficient clean fresh water supply, and that number is growing very rapidly. Because of the work done by Steve, Robbie, and others like them, there is hope that we can shrink that number. In a world where talk of gas and oil are the big topic of the day, at the end of the day, it is only water that we cannot live without. Wow. Amazing cave, really beautiful. Great dive. Fresh water is one of the non-renewable natural resources that we all need to safeguard. And there's so little study and understanding about aquifers, uh, about groundwater, about flow through groundwater and everything else that they definitely need a lot more study and a lot more understanding. And the work I do as an explorer hopefully lays the pathway that the scientists and the experts can follow along behind me and they can learn more about this environment, they can learn more uh, about the hydrology of this environment and that way we can understand it better and we can appreciate it more and we hopefully can get it the conservation and protection that it needs because all of us, all the ecosystems, all the plants, all the animals are dependent upon this fresh water here and in other parts of the world and we really need to protect and conserve it. So we'll be back here again tomorrow doing some uh, more diving, some more exploration, trying to uh, understand a little bit more about this truly amazing world that we live in. Um, yeah, life doesn't get any better. I'm happy. Yeah.
child. 